Today, uh, today's Parsha Shior is sponsored by uh, Stephen Leah Roth. It is. There she is. I'm here, but Steve has promised me he would be here. <laughs> he's coming, he's coming. He's a good guy. But you no. know you can't depend on him. <laughs> he's a good guy. In honor of the bat mitzvah, of the granddaughter, Sophie Roth. It was nice to have the family here, so mazel yeah. tov. A lot of nachas from all the cute uh, eight o'clock. No. And uh, good luck uh, cleaning up your home after yeah. Shabbos. But it was very nice to have them here. It's very lovely to Kenai Nohara. Uh, with, with the 8 o'clock. Parshat Toldot, are you ready? Yeah. Yes. So, uh, we as a nation, we as a people, uh, at times deal with internal issues. Internal issues. We don't get along sometimes. Uh, machloikis. You know what machloikis is? It's a fancy word for a fight. We have internal issues, and we also have external issues as well as a nation. We view ourselves as a unit, the Jewish people, a very special unit, and we face, unfortunately, often threats from the outside, anti-Semitism. Those are external issues. Uh, we do believe, we do believe that when there's hatred towards the Jewish people, uh, when the existence of the Jewish state is questioned, those are obviously forms of anti-Semitism. And we know that something's not right. When these things are occurring in the world, you made it, these things are simply, it indicates that something is not operating as it should. Right? Things are not aligned as they should. And we as Jews recognize that we have this uh, responsibility, responsibility to go ahead and be mindful of the fact that things are not as they should be and ask ourselves, what can we do internally to go ahead and get things back on track? Right? That's how we deal with <laughs> anti-Semitism. So obviously we work on security. And obviously we work on Hasbara. And obviously we work on education. And all these things are very, very important. But we also are mindful of the fact that something is not right. And as a result, we turn to ourselves and ask, what can we do? Right? How can we become better to go ahead and try to realign, realign our whole existence? And as a result, the existence of the world. That is how we deal with anti-Semitism. So the external and the internal issues make their appearance in this week's Parsha. Parsha told up. It is the Parsha that really, really introduces traditional anti-Semitism. And we also have the roots of internal issues as well. The anti-Semitism anti we're going to be reading about and facing in this week's Parsha has to do with the success of Yitzchak, the second patriarch, and the fact that the locals had great difficulty with this Jewish success. It was very painful for them. And as a result, they decided to hurt this successful Jew, but by doing so, they hurt themselves as well. That is traditional anti-Semitism, where the hate is great. It is so great that they are willing to hurt themselves in the process. And if you want to know if this concept still exists, well, there's a place called the Middle East. Now look in the Middle East and ask yourselves, what would have happened in 1948 if the nations around Israel would have said, you know what, they're here, let's work together. Right? Imagine where Jordan would be today. Imagine where Syria would be today. Right? Imagine where Egypt would be today if that would have been the attitude. But the attitude is hatred is going indeed to be far greater than the love they have to their own children. 
That is anti-Semitism, and that makes its appearance in this week's portion. So those are the external issues that appear and we're going to read about. The internal issues, unfortunately, have to do with the fact that here we have, for the first time, two brothers, Yaakov and Esav. They share a father and they share a mother, right? So when it came to, when it came to Yishmael and Yitzchak, children of Abraham, so we were com quite comfortable dealing with Yishmael saying, you know what? He's a pere adam, he's a pere, a wild man. Pere, the viltkeit, right, the wildness that came obviously from the mother. In other words, we could blame something external. The Odom aspects, the fact that there is some menschlichkeit, well, that's from Avram Avinu, right? That's how we deal with this Ishmael. Historically, it's very, very interesting to note that uh, uh, the Muslims, the Arabs, there were periods that they were the, they were the educated ones. Right? You want to go ahead in the 16th century, early 16th century, if you have some money, right, and you're escaping Spain, and you want to go to an advanced country that's cultured, don't go to Eastern Europe. Right? You don't go to Poland. Poland is a very primitive place in the 16th century. Many, many of the practices that probably seeped even out of the pagan religions in that, religions in that region. 16th century Poland, don't go there. If you have a few, a few um, whatever currency they have, florins. Russian. You have a few florins, florins. Russian. At that period of time, you go to an advanced country, you go to Turkey. Turkey is, why? Islam. Islam at the time, and go back, even Maimonides. Where did Maimonides get the bulk of his wisdom that was not Torah wisdom? Well, that was due to the fact that he was able to read the works that were written in Arabic. So. The Muslims themselves have good times in their past. They had times that they were indeed in Odom, right? Unfortunately, they have within themselves also a pere, a vilkait, a, a, a wildness that makes its appearance at different times, right? So that's Ishmael. So Ishmael, we deal with him and view him as an outsider, but here we finally have someone, a true, complete brother. Yaakov has a brother by the name of Esav. They share a mother, they share a father. But there are issues, and we consider those issues internal issues. And that's what we're going to go ahead and realize, that this Parsha starts off with the internal, moves on into the external, moves back into the internal. But obviously the Parsha wants to communicate this idea that you should know, you want to fix the external issues that the Jewish people face, Take care of the internal as well. So that's going to be, we'll run through it. So on page 124, page 124, we have, uh, the, after some difficulty, Rebecca's uh, birth of these children. And on page 126, we, are, we already introduce them, on page 126, as very, very different from birth, uh, where Esav is... is, is labeled as an ish yodea tzayit. He has an understanding of hunting, a man of the field. While Jacob was a person who spent time in the tent, meditation and study, he's a tent man. Now, there's this interaction on the age of page 126 where this <coughs> birthright is, which technically belongs to Esav, is sold to Yaakov. And the way Esav views this right, he sees it as something that is not really worthwhile in the long term because he states in verse 32 on page 126, he says to Yaakov, listen, Hinei anochi holech lamut. You know, I'm going to die. Velama zeli bechora. What value does this birthright to be the leader of the family, to be the one that takes charge of the household, what value does that have to me? There was a great rabbi in Prague in the 18th century by the name of Rabbi Cheskel Landau, known as the Noda Bi Yehuda. Why is he known as Noda Bi Yehuda? If he has a nice name by the name of Cheskel Landau, because that's the name of his work. And rabbis are often identified by their work. It becomes their life. And he was asked a question about someone who owned... Uh, fields and woods and land, and he enjoyed hunting. 
So he wanted some guidance from Rabbi Yechezkel Landau. What is the Jewish view of hunting? That's what he wanted to know. So Rabbi Yechezkel Landau says to him, listen, technically it's not going to be Tsar Balechaim. He deals with a very a, a technical issue because we are sensitive to the welfare of animals. But in a situation that the human benefits, it is permissible. But then he ends up saying the following. You should know that if you look in the Tanakh and you want to know who were the ones that were considered hunters, we only have Nimrod and Esav. Those are the two that are considered hunters. It's not a Jewish practice. And then he notes that there's a danger as well. It's dangerous and a person should not place himself in a situation of danger. <coughs> If a person has to go out and earn a living and it involves entering into danger, dangerous environments, for example, uh, take, take a, a, a boat ride in the 14th century, there was a significant danger. If you were doing it for fun, the rabbis would tell you not to do it. It is actually prohibited to place yourself in a situation where statistically it is dangerous. If you are doing it to support a family, that's the way the world works. You have to support a family. So therefore, says no to Yehuda, to go ahead and if a person has to enter into these fields and interact with these wild animals, if you have to, you have to. But to do it for a sport, that's very un-Jewish. That's very, very un-Jewish. And he says that there's actually a verse that indicates that if a person is a hunter, there is a strong possibility that he's not going to survive because Esav said, Hinei anochi holech lamut. Meaning, look at, my, look at what I'm involved in. I'm um, involved in a field that indeed has some significant danger, and therefore I will not live. So what's interesting from this point is the fact that here you have, if you look at these few verses, this is the beginning of a Jew, a Jew, right? That's, you know, in the, in the household of Yitzchak and Rivka. And he's beginning this process of moving away from these values. And the first statement that indicates a person is not really attached and part of our fundamental values are a lack of appreciation for the value of life. This is really fundamental. What is fundamentally a Jewish trait? Number one, or I would call it mitzvah number one, value life value existence. Right. It is so fundamental that when the Torah wants to tell us Esau is selling this right, selling his future, right? It's not going to be Elokei Abraham, Yitzchak, Yaakov, and Esau. He's out. What really puts him on the track out? Not appreciation, appreciating the value of life. And it is so fundamental because sometimes you have systems of education to talk about mitzvot, right? That you have to go ahead and observe kashrut, shabbat, and they give you these things and you have to work on yourself and become a better person. All true, but that is page two. Page one is value existence. Value the fact that you are here, that there's a person, that you are a living person. Kol haneshama tehalelka. That with every neshama and every neshima, with every breath, something is achieved. You take that breath, right, and especially... You know, you go, you go ahead and you merit to be in a place where there's good, clean, enjoyable air. You walk through the woods or sometimes by the ocean and you can take that deep breath and it's clean air. You are supposed to sense, I am achieving something, right? I am, my neshama is going to a neshima, value life. Step number one, that's how you are a good Jew. Because we know very well that if you don't value life, everything else, right, is not going to get you where you're supposed to get. So this is one piece of information that's indeed fundamental. Yes? How does vegetarianism come in, or why are we allowed to eat meat? I mean, Hashem gave us the permission to eat meat after the mubble. Before the mubble, people didn't eat meat. So right. What is, the, is that the ultimate, or is this the ultimate? You, are you talking about specifically uh, the, the general of meat? It's, okay, we had, in Parshas Noah, when we had, uh, we had a discussion about is it considered an ideal or not, it appears, it appears, and the way we dealt with it was, in this day and age, it's a necessity, because by eating meat, it reminds us of the fact that we are not animals. If a person feels, and this is something that's very interesting, that people, people that are very involved in the welfare of animals, and people that work for PETA, that they're going to go ahead and spend their life to defend from a dolphin to a chicken. There's something to learn from them, because we do have this sensitivity. 
But if that becomes your whole essence and your whole religion, that you are basically an animal, you have feelings, they have feelings, they communicate, you communicate, right? We share 99% of our DNA with a chimpanzee, so we're very much a chimpanzee, right? So if that becomes your whole essence, so then the line between human and animal is blurred or even lost, and when it is lost, you act like an animal, right? Why can I not do whatever I desire? So that is the, the reason that the Torah, after the flood, states, you know what? The way you will remember that you are different than an ox is by having him on your dinner plate, right? Because then you will realize, if I eat it, and that's why there's supposed to be mindfulness when you eat. Now, if someone says to me, um, I, what, is it okay to become a vegetarian in Jewish law? Is it okay? That's a very a broad discussion. There is a sensitivity that we should have. We should have a sensitivity that they do have feelings. And the Talmud itself shares with us stories of great rabbis who were punished because they were lacking that sensitivity. So sensitivity, yes. Sensitivity, yes. But to go ahead and make it the whole essence of your of values and to determine that ethics are basically how you treat animals, that is not uh, the Jewish way of viewing things. Okay? Okay. okay, that's the hunting. But don't go hunting. In other words, you can let, you know, I know that you know, a lot of it's, there's elections today in the United States, and you vote, you know, many of you are supportive of the Republicans. But nevertheless, uh, hunting, hunting, it's not a Jewish thing to do. For a sport to go ahead and kill animals, right? That's not, you know, it's, you know so let the Trump kids do it. They're not the ones that convert it. But uh, not something that's considered ideal. Back, let's get back to this, to this Parsha itself. In, on page 128, you have a shift to the external issue when, uh, when Yitzchak has to settle in the land of the Philistines during a famine. And God Almighty promises him that even though that this is a difficult time in a far from ideal land, he's going to have success, and indeed so, he reaps hundredfold from what he plants, me'ash arim. And... Obviously, Jewish success on page 130 brings jealousy. So if you turn to page, to page 130, verse 14, we are told here that this incredible success that Yitzchak has during these years of difficulty, he is able to acquire flocks, herds, right? And as a result, at the end of verse 14, Vaikanu oto plishtim. What happens? Jealous. They're jealous. And if you look, where else in the Torah do we find this word vayikanu, that others are jealous? Yosef. Yosef and his brothers. And this is as if a code word that, you know what? You know what? Yes, you are facing here classical anti-Semitism. Uh, but guess what? If you want to fix it, if you want to fix it, we're not blaming the Jews for things. Let's make this clear, right? We have nothing against the Jews. We're not blaming them. But there has to be an awakening when we see such challenges that we have to realize things are not as they should be and focus on a fix. How do you fix things? Jewish unity, right? And you know the absurdity that comes out at times when there is a tragedy from the outside, that there are times that we use it as an opportunity to eat one another up alive. I don't know if, you know, if you're aware of the, such an existence, <laughs> that we Jews have this incredible talent. We're attacked from the outside, and what are we going to do? Start labeling others all kind of names, and things that are circulating are absurd. And right here we are told, if you are concerned about vaikanu otop lishtima, if you are concerned from the jealousy that leads to hate, that leads to attacks from the outside, focus on uprooting the Vaikanu, which appears, it's the only two places in the Torah, focus on fixing the internal jealousy. This is a very important message uh, that we get here. Now, uh, the, uh, on, it, it continues, the interaction, the interaction with the Philistines continue on page 132, and you have to realize that when the way they dealt, the way they channeled their hatred towards Yitzchak was by filling in these wells. It is extremely significant because wells were the source of life. You would not have a society and you would not have a city, you would not have people in a permanent residency if it was not next to a water source. So, sealing and removing from others their water source is removing life. 
And obviously by doing that, the Philistines were hurting not just Yitzchak, but hurting themselves. But that's the goal. The goal is to hurt the Jew. Now, for Yitzchak, the well does something more than that, because you have to remember that when Avram Avinu would dig a well, he would attract people. It was a service to others. And by having that well and having people around him, he was able to communicate his values. He would not just supply them with water, he would supply them with guidance, explain to them what the purpose of life is about. That was Avraham Avinu. So remember that Be'er, the Be'er, is, like is really the key word of what Avraham Avinu was about, right? He wanted to spread Jewish values, right? That Yehudit, we could call it, by the Be'er. That's the essence of Avraham Avinu. Yitzchak naturally is a very different personality, right? He is a person that, if, if you look at the, the image of Yitzchak, you have to place him by the Akedah. This is a person that is not interacting with the world, but meditating, right? Thinking about God, which is obviously significant. He is a person that is like a Korban. Now, obviously, he himself was not the Korban, but there was a ram that took over that role. But he is considered still like the Ayo. And we compare him as well as some pleasant aroma to God, like a Korban, which has been identified as a Reach Nichoach Lashem, like Tsamim. That was the life of Yitzchak, not focusing on the others. And I mentioned that because we're going to return on the bottom of page 132 to Esav. We're going to return to Esav. And Esav himself, we are told, if you look at the last verses on page 132, that Esav at age 40 marries, marries two women. One of them is Yehudit Bat Be'eri, the Chiti, and the other one is Basmat Bat Eilon. And the Torah presents these names because we are also being told that Esav externally wanted to keep up this image of someone that's sticking to the values of the family, right? Someone that still respects these traditions that he saw at home. He wants to be like his grandfather, right? He wants to be like his father. But that was all external. He's not an authentic Jew, right? It's external. And if you look at the names here, when his grandfather Avraham focused on teaching the Jewish Yehudit values by a Be'er, so the first wife he takes is Yehudit, Yehudit, Bat Be'eri, which comes from the word Be'er, the well. So Judith, Yehudit, right? A beautiful name, right? It symbolizes Jewish, Jewishness, Jewishness by the well. And the second wife is trying to present the idea that he is a follower of his father's philosophy and his father's way of living, where it's basmat, like bosem, like a pleasant aroma to God, but elon, like an ail. Ail is the ram, right? So you see here, and the rabbis are telling us that you should know that this is a person that externally, externally, wants to stick to the values or present his life as if he is part of these values of, uh, of Jewishness, but really he's not. Now, Let's start chapter 27, which we're going to be dealing with the blessings. Yitzchak is old. Vahi, ki, zaken, right? Yitzchak. So Yitzchak is becoming old. Now, if you want to know, according to Torah, what is considered an old age? Drum roll. So, no, 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 don't, don't, don't scare anyone. Let's, let's give it, let's give, uh, we're trying to give something smooth and nice here. 123. So you're, everyone, everyone's okay. 123. This is what the rabbis tell us. That Yitzchak at the time is 123 years old, right? And Kenainar, right, he makes it to 180, by the way. So he's, he's still good. But he's 123 years old. So you're not really uh, old until you reach 123. Now, unfortunately, his, his eyes are dimmed and his vision uh, is weak. And he calls Esav that he wants to bless his son and he wants to feel this attachment to his son to transmit these blessings. So therefore he asks him to go ahead and provide food for him. Uh, you know the story because he, every single year he does the same thing, Yaakov. What does he do? He steals these blessings guided by his mom. Uh, his, his, father, his father is eventually finds out but nevertheless gives his son Yaakov uh, some additional blessings, the blessings of Avraham, which it does appear that Yitzchak did not have the intention 
of making a sub the, the continuation of this chain, meaning it is not that Yitzchak had a vision that one day people are going to be praying, Elokei Avraham, Elokei Yitzchak, Elokei Esav. This is not what Yitzchak had in mind. He had in mind that there's going to be some kind of partnership where Esav focuses on the physical, and thus he needed these physical blessings, and Yaakov would be more the spiritual one and continue with the tradition of Abraham. This is how it appears. We've addressed this in the past. Now, there's a great rabbi. Rab Ovadia of Sephorno, early 16th century. And he, he wonders, you know, you know, the weakness of the vision of Yitzchak, right. it, it seems to indicate that there was some kind of flaw he had. In other words, when it comes to biblical figures, we assume that if someone like Yitzchak, who is obviously someone very attached to God Almighty, uh, is suffering through an ailment, there must be a reason for it. Now, it's very dangerous to share such statements because then you have fools who transmit this way of thinking into the 21st century. And you have these individuals that try to apply it today to explain why things happen. I don't know if you've ever interacted with such people that they tell you why things uh, uh, do occur. Uh, the rule of thumb and common sense is remember to ignore these people because they have absolutely no idea what they're talking about. Right? And I'm being kind because these are really fools that believe that they are still prophets. And there are people out there, usually it's charismatic individuals that have followers, and it sounds good when you could manipulate God, meaning when you could claim that you know why things are occurring. But when it comes to understanding the personalities, especially these personalities, there are commentators like this Rab Ovadia who feel comfortable to go ahead and state there was a flaw there. There was a flaw of Yitzchak. Now, you have to realize also that in some schools, you would not hear a rabbi stating that one of the patriarchs or the matriarchs had a flaw. That's like unacceptable. And there are those that share that story. I, had, I went to yeshiva in Chicago, in Tells. And one of the, the dean of the yeshiva at the time, one of the, the heads of the yeshiva was a rabbi by the name of Rabbi Schmelzer. And he shared with me an interesting story that the tradition in Tells was that they felt comfortable to quote authorities like this Farno and share a statement that is critical of one of the patriarchs or the matriarchs. They felt comfortable. That was the Tells tradition. Uh, the Tells joke was that you would get up at a bar mitzvah and you would start talking about Avram and say Avram had this flaw, Yitzchak had that flaw, Yaakov had that flaw, but the bar mitzvah boy is such an amazing young man. <laughs> that was the Tells uh, tradition. So this is how we... So this Rabbi Schmelzer is at a Nagura convention, and he was honored as a young man, perhaps even in his 30s, to give, to give a, a talk. And sitting behind him were two rabbis. One of them was Ramosha Feinstein, and one was Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky, who in the 1970s are really the leaders of American Jewry. And he shared a Telzer insight where he was sharing, probably from this Sforno or others, where there was a level of criticism of one of the patriarchs. Obviously, when we share such criticism, is not to become uh, Bible critics, but rather to focus on a flaw where you could learn from it. And perhaps it is even an honor for them that we focus on some flaw they had, and we state the Torah shares with us this flaw because we need to learn that it is within human nature to have that weakness, and therefore, in life, the goal is to learn and become better. That is the Tell's approach. So he shares one of these Divrei Torah, and he notes that as soon as he finished, Ramosha Feinstein comes over to him and says to him, it wasn't appropriate, meaning Ramosha Feinstein did not approve of it. And he says that a minute after that, Rav Yaakov Kamenetsky came over to him and said that was beautiful. <laughs> meaning that was, so he was trying to express that there has been always two schools. Now, Rav Ovadia of Sforno, when he is assessing, assessing this uh, uh, physical decline and this ailment of the vision of Yitzchak, notes the following that you should know, what's the goal of vision? The goal of vision is to see what's ahead. And to see what's ahead is not just in uh, the physical sense, but you want to be sure that the next generation sticks to the values that are important to us today. 
Or we talk about it often. Mm -hmm. That we really have to be thinking day in, day out, how is Judaism going to look in 100 years from now? And this should really be a concern. And we, every decision we make, right, about what kind of lessons we're going to teach, or where we are donating our funds, right, or what institutions we're going to encourage people uh, to support, it has to be with what we want Judaism to look like 100 years from now. That's vision. That's vision. Now, says this Farno, Yitzchak, with all due respect, had a problem with his vision. He had a problem with his vision. And he says, and he's not the first person who, when he is not guiding the next generation appropriately, is going to have this issue with physical vision. He says there was a person who was a high priest in the city of Shiloh. Shiloh, before the temple becomes a permanent structure in Jerusalem. So for 369 years, we had the city of Shiloh as a hub. Many of us visited uh, Shiloh a few years ago. In Shiloh, there's an old high priest, a 98-year-old man by the name of Eli. And Eli, we are told, has an issue with his vision. Why is it? His children became very, very comfortable in the position. And they felt that they deserve the honor. They deserve the income that comes in. And were not doing their job. And Eli, the father, did not guide, did not rebuke, was not careful to go ahead and direct the children as he should. So he was lacking vision. If you do not put focus on the next generation the way you should, the vision is impacted, the physical ish vision will be impacted. So comes Svarna, and he says to us regarding Yitzchak, you want to know why the Torah is telling us that his eyes were dimmed? Says Svarna, Yitzchak nechshal Yitzchak nechshal, he failed. Strong word, by the way, right? Shehishtadel levarechet esav. You have an esav, right? A vildechaya, a person that is lacking those values that are so important for you. Avram and Yitzchak try to have an impact on the world. And here this fellow that externally does these right things, you bless him, right? So therefore, his eyes became weak as it occurred to Eli. This is how, this is how Sforno understands the mistake of Yitzchak. Okay? Now, with this understanding that there is a problem here. Now, obviously, it is fixed to an extent, but Sforno notes Yitzchak does walk away with some blessings, and those blessings did create problems in the long term. But what's the key here? In other words, if this is a part about the internal flaws and external flaws, so I'm going to present the following. <coughs> that you should know, when we as Jews, right, declare that someone is this ideal Jew, and he is not, when we go ahead and honor someone, and consider someone to be this Jew that everyone else should try to emulate, and becomes a role model, and he is not, that is the problem that we must fix if we want to avoid anti-Semitism. And to, to give it a little bit more clarity, I have there appeared the work of Jean-Paul Sartre. Right? You've heard of Sartre, the great uh, French philosopher. And he wrote, he, he was very fascinated about Jews. He wrote a lot about Jews. And eventually in his old age, it's very interesting that the Sartre when it comes among the French, like Sartre is France, I think that during the 1968 uh, up, uh, uh, activities that many of you uh, remember as current events, right, the 1968, uh, what was happening on college campuses and on the streets of Paris, so there was uh, a movement by students, and the, the figurehead behind it was Jean-Paul Sartre. He's obviously older, but he was like, uh, the, the, the symbol of the movement, and the goal said you can't arrest Sartre because Sartre is France, right? The leader of the movement uh, in the streets then was a fellow by the name of Pierre Victor, Pierre Victor, and eventually Pierre Victor, who had a very close relationship with Sartre, Sartre told him, you know what, you have to be more authentic, you should use your real name from now on, and he started using his real name, which was Benny Levy. 
Ben <laughs> now, Benny Levy, Benny Levy was considered, he was a, a brilliant individual, very charismatic. He led, really, the May 1968 uh, activities there in Paris, but eventually, at, uh, in the late 70s, he became more interested in his roots, encouraged by Sartre, and eventually went to yeshiva, and eventually he became a complete Baal and he spent his last years in Yerushalayim sitting and studying Talmud. Now, towards the, in, 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 at some point in the journey, he was still studying with Sartre, and Sartre got interested in his Jewish, Jewish outlook, and Sartre started giving these philosophical explanations to Tchias HaMesim. It's a very fascinating development about Benny Levy. I'm still waiting for a good book, I think in French. There's, so I have two options, either to learn French or wait for a book in English. But Benny Levy is an interesting name uh, uh, to remember when it comes. But Sartre, when he talks about Jews, he says the following. He's writing this in 1944. And he says, the inauthentic Jew flees Jewish reality, right? And the anti-Semite makes him a Jew in spite of himself. Does that happen? That you think, you know, I'm, I'm not just a regular citizen. I'm a citizen of the United States. Right? I'm like everyone else. Right? What happens, says Sartre, the anti-Semite says, you know what? You're a Jew. On the other hand, he says, the authentic Jew makes himself a Jew in the face of all and against all. The authentic Jew says, you know what? I'm a Jew. I am a Jew. The inauthentic Jew is the danger. And especially when we go ahead and claim that this, this is the symbol of Judaism, right? This is this ideal Jew. And here we could go ahead and understand. Yitzchak faces anti-Semitism. Yitzchak faces traditional, or he is facing, and this is really the root of anti-Semitism. Doing good, helping others, but the jealousy of the others are going to cause Yitzchak to lose and at the same time hurt themselves. Why is he facing anti-Semitism? So Sfarno would say because he was nechshal. He failed in this area. He failed in not recognizing that you cannot bless Asa. You cannot go ahead and take this Jew who externally acts like a Jew, but is corrupted from within. If you make him this paradigm, if you make him the symbol of what a Jew is supposed to be, you're going to suffer from the outside. And that's why this is the Parsha that tells us we have external issues, the way we address them is by during, de addressing the internal issues. You know, when I, I was thinking of presenting this idea that there are Jews that were not proud of uh, their activities, right? They're not proud of their, of their values. So obviously, most people would say, if you're looking for a name, who would you choose? Soros. George Soros. George Soros is going to be the name, right? <laughs> is this a Jew, really? Right? Is, is this the value of a Jew? But I'm going to present one, but I don't have uh, facts, but it's something that disturbed me a little bit. It's something that disturbed me. And again, the idea is we take someone, we consider him the ideal when the core of Judaism is lacking there. But I don't know it as a fact, but nevertheless, I'm going to present it because it appeared in the media and just, it hurt, it hurt me. Have you heard of executive order from the United States of America, obviously, 13818? Probably not, okay. There's an executive order signed by I, Donald J. Trump, okay? And it was signed in, the, was I think December of uh, last year. And this was an executive order that is blocking the property of persons involved in serious human rights abuse or corruption. Now you have to remember that I don't think he researched these things, but rather he was fed by the State Department. And it is possible, it is possible that there is an agenda within the State Department, and as a result, what you're going to be hearing soon is, should be taken with a grain of salt, but nevertheless. So writes President Trump here, I, Donald J. Trump, President of the United States of America, find that the prevalence and severity of human rights abuse and corruption that have uh, outside the United States and he says the following, that have reached such a scope and gravity that they threaten the stability of international political and economical systems. Human rights abuse and corruption undermine the values that form an essential foundation of stable, secure, and functioning societies. 
have devastating impacts on individuals, weaken democratic institutions, <coughs> degrade the rule of law, perpetuate violent conflicts, facilitate the activities of dangerous person and undermine economic markets, the United States seeks to impose tangible and significant consequences on those who commit serious human rights abuse, and therefore, obviously, they're going to freeze the assets of specific individuals. 13 names on the list. Okay, 13 names on this list. How many are Jewish? No, I don't, so the truth is, only one of them, uh, one of them called out to me. Only one of the names rang a bell, and thus was disturbing. So out of the 13, number three is a fellow by the name of Dan Gertler. Dan Gertler. Date of birth, December 1973. Nationality, Israel. Okay. Now, why does this one disturb me? Because in specific communities, Dan Gertler is a big hero. He gives a lot of tzedakah, right? He gives a lot of tzedakah. He supports institutions, right? So he became in many ways the symbol of what, you know, if, if you go ahead and... In, in some societies, when the wealthy person uh, uh, walks in, so, you know, great honor is given to him, right? My father used to share the, the joke that when he was uh, in yeshiva, right, late 1950s, so there was sometimes a little bit of a, a, a negative outlook on balabatim within the yeshiva itself. Now, what's the term balabatim? People that are out there in the world, right? Earning a living, working hard. And there was a little bit of neg a negative outlook towards them because they're not sitting within the walls of the yeshiva. And then my father says, one day he's learning and a person walked in and all the, everyone jumps up and honors him and welcomes him. And my father asked, where is that? You know, who, who is this? And they said, my father, what do you mean? He's a balabas, right? He's, in other words, he's a, he's a balabas. And meaning he's a, a person that came and, and my father said this seems to be a contradiction here. In other words, the language we use and the honor we bestow upon them seems to be a little bit of a contradiction. This is what my father shared from his challenges as a 16-year-old. Now, <laughs> when it comes to the, the, these worlds, Dan Gettler is a, a very significant name. Major it's Douglas. But to go ahead and read that there's an executive order because of his activities in the Congo, where Congo, as you could imagine, is a corrupt society that has tremendous natural resources in diamonds. And it seems to be that this guy, Dan Gertler, developed friendships uh, with politicians there. And these are not exactly politicians that are elected in the most kosher ways, if at all there are elections in these countries. And the result is that millions of dollars right, are taken out of the economy when the locals are getting nothing. Right? This is something that's disturbing to the State Department, and therefore we have this executive order. Why does it bother me? Why does it bother me? I don't like when we create an ideal image when you are dealing with someone, when you are dealing with someone that is not the ideal image. The ideal image of a Jew is a Jew that is concerned for the welfare, not just of the Jewish people, and obviously we, our responsibility starts with Klal Yisrael, no question about that. But we have to think about a civil, other civilizations. And if you indeed could go ahead, the image that I am proud of is when you have members and people in the state of Israel that work on uh, supplying water right, to villages that are miles away from a source of water, and they go ahead and they bring such technology to Africa, that makes me proud because that shares, that shows concern for humanity. It shows what Judaism is about, right? That yes, we are like Avraham Avinu. Avraham Avinu did two things. He supplied the be'er, he supplied the well, and then he taught values. That's what we are about. We supply the well, right? We supply the water. And if a country has some natural resources, we go ahead and give them these natural resources and we assist them to go ahead and build their economy. Obviously, we have to have Jewish values, right? We have to go ahead and say, listen, we are assisting you because we as a nation understand that there's a higher being and there are ethics. And for HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the, the rule of law is important. So you African countries, instead of settling things with tribes in a field, killing one another, go ahead and develop some kind of institution where you could debate issues, right? And have justice. That's the foundation of Yiddishkeit, right? Mishpat and Staka. That is the ideal Jew. And if we go ahead and promote that ideal Jew, 
then we could go ahead and hope, at least, that we put an end to anti-Semitism. But if we are nechshal, if we fail, by giving blessings to someone that externally looks good, but internally is lacking those fundamental values, nechshal, that is the failing that we are still facing today, and then, unfortunately, we're going to be dealing with these external threats. This is the message, perhaps, of Parashat Toldot. We need to fix things from within if we expect things to be good from the outside, right? And these, no question about it, right? We have to work on security and we could work on Hasbara, but all that is not going to settle until we get to the core. To get to the core, by the way, you have to understand what is the essence of Judaism. Right? What are the core values of Judaism, right? Is it a stringency in one law, right, that you should be machmer in something? Or is it a bigger picture of what? Of sensitivity, of justice. Is it a, a, a religion that tells you that you utter a few words and mission accomplished? Or is it a religion that tells you that when you utter words, think what it's about, and it should have an impact on who you are? When we create the proper Jew, then we could go ahead and hope that we're not going to have to deal with the challenge of the outside. So that should be the goal. Let's work on becoming authentic Jews, right? Then understand, study the Torah, study the values, and by becoming authentic Jews, we pray that we shouldn't have to deal uh, with the hatred that we face from the outside. Thank you. Thank you again to our sponsors, and everyone have a good day.